All right. So, what is your name? Uh, my name is Joe Joe Charmelli. And why are you here? I'm here for Evo 2011 World Fighting Game Tournament. Evolution 2011 World Final. Let's see if Puto is not immune to nerves. Oh wow. Daigo Ooh. saying, smell you're a little bit off here. Nice, there's the randomness the from Puto. Oh, he fades it out. Great timing, great timing there. I know he has a lot of anti young And there he is again. Such a brutal guessing game from set. That's what it's all about. Front, back, high, low, grab, and go. Oh! Wow. Drops a little bit there. Oh, Canadian dizzy, picks up. Dizzy. And Daigo is dizzy. All over him, and that's going to be the end. Yes, with the toe taps. Match point for Kobe. I guess you, if, if you can't fall dizzy because you died, that's just fine by Punko. Catching Will he the burn the X to keep the combo going? Yes, yes he does. Really styling. Stop, 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 dying. What's going to be? Oh. up, up. He is working on a perfect to get Daigo in the heart of the beast. Good cross off and another brilliant read from Kuko. This is unprecedented. He oh, and the day! Hey, this is gonna be it! A perfect! Some people are raised on baseball and football. I was raised on ColecoVision and Atari 7800. Arcades were like milestones, landmarks, you name it. Those are like part of our youth. It wasn't just the arcades. It was just a whole boom of new technology that hasn't really been seen before. You know, be able to control objects on a screen. Pretty much every major milestone in my life was, was related to video games. The first time I ever <laughs> kiss somebody who was in an alley behind an arcade. It's influencing and inspiring people in ways well beyond just sitting there playing. Several decades have built up to this culture and you can't really shake it now. We're still playing Mario Brothers. We're still thinking about Pong and Space Invaders. For better or for worse, I mean, I hate Mario Brothers. I hate it. There's no indication that the girl wanted to be rescued. Not only that, but all of the wildlife in, in Mario Brothers getting along fine. Um, living in stasis and, and kind of self-sustaining ecosystem until we as the player, the transgressor, we come along and butcher them all, we murder them. At the time that video games came out, there had already been about 40 years or 50 years of the traditional arcade being in existence. And they were commonly recreational rooms with a few pinball, a few pool tables. And way back, they used to be connected to the Mafia, a lot of them were. Not all of them, probably, but enough of them that you could say it's a Mafia-driven business. The pinball was a nickel. Put a nickel, you could play it. But if you offered them another free game, saying it's a gambling, and, they, and pinballs were where children are, and they, some of the people didn't like the kids getting raised on gambling. And so you saw pictures in, uh, you know, the Chicago Tribune where 
some sheriff or some district attorney was breaking up pinball machines and with axes and things like that. To prove to various cities and counties and states that the pinball was an amusement device, Roger Sharp became the voice of the pinball and did a very, very good job in getting a lot of these uh, rules relaxed. In a, a court hearing, he was able to call Babe Ruth style uh, a shot. He said, look, if I pull a plunger like this, it's going to bounce here, 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 and go straight down this hole. And he did it, and the court legalized pinball in New York again. And uh, it's kind of, I wonder like what would happen if he had missed his shot. I'm the director of Stuff and Things at the Las Vegas Pinball Hall of Fame. I've been doing pinball since 72. That's, that's all I know how to do and I'm too stupid to stop. Uh, basically, we're a bunch of pinball collectors that got together and decided that it was stupid to have whole bunches of pinball machines and just leave them in your garage. So we decided to um, figure out a way that we could put them in a space and let the public come into that space and play them. And that's what we have here. Well, pinball arcades are pretty much over. Um, the economics of pinball is not very good right now. The machines cost a lot. They break down a lot. People aren't putting them out like they used to. When I was growing up, every 7-Eleven had two or three. Every bar had four or five. Pinball used to be everywhere. And then one day, it all just disappeared. Well, we keep a few video games around just so that when dad shows up to play the pinball, the kids have something to do. We got the older, simpler, slower 8-bit games like Pac-Man, Galaga, stuff like that. Pinball, to me, has always been a better test of skill than the little baby video games. People, people that are young children play video games. Real men play pinball. That's why they call it Game Boy. My name is Brent Bushnell. My dad is the founder of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. So, uh, you know, I like to say that basically, you know, my childhood didn't suck. <laughs> I saw a, uh, a demonstration of a Magavox home game, but I thought it was pretty crappy. And I thought that it'd be interesting to bring it up to the digital function, because it was sort of an analog game and pretty mushy. I assigned it to a guy named Alan Alcorn. And pretty soon, we had a game that became Pong <laughs> that blew the doors off. And Atari was started, and we never looked back. In the mid-70s, Atari had been having great success with their dedicated Pong machine. And so they created the Atari video computer system, which later became the Atari 2600. My mission in life is to save all of mankind. Atari 2600 was the first big mainstream console. It's kind of funny, like, because back then they would make Atari versions of arcade games, and they looked nothing like it, and they barely played like it. It sounded horrible, looked horrible, but still, like, kind of, you know, gave you the little fix. We have here the uh, Atari 2600 joystick. It's a great classic joystick with the stick and the button and the joy that comes with it. For me, it was very important from the beginning, uh, the controller, because uh, it's the first time machine gives you a little hand, and you have a hand say, quite an homosexual experience, right? You have like a big guy that would never even think of touch another male, but there he is, <laughs> grabbing controller all day, in the same way, right? And people really got into it, they had the one button, and they're just like, hammer away at it. And funny thing is you can plug that joystick into a Sega Genesis and it'll work. I really wanted the Atari 2600, but um, my father came home with the television. I mean, television was kind of like the bastard, red-headed stepchild that came out after the Atari. But the television could display more colors. It had better graphics. Which of these games is the closest thing to the real thing? A, in television. B, Atari. If you put the Atari baseball game up 
and you put the Intellivision baseball game up, the Intellivision one looks like you see a baseball diamond. That's baseball. <laughs> if you thought A, Intellivision, you're absolutely correct. Because Mattel was this toy company and family and everything like that, they really were going to try to make it the basis of a whole computer educational system. It'd be games, it would be education, it would be stock market analysis, all of the stuff. The thing was, though, from the very beginning, people wanted games. People wanted simple games. The, the Intellivision here, and most people know it because it had this controller that looked kind of like a, a cordless phone of the era, this very complicated and uncomfortable looking disc thing. The controller was basically like a number pad with like a weird metal disc that you controlled with these weird buttons on the side. I guess you could call it revolutionary. A lot of people with the discs and stuff, they still don't understand the disc. They go, oh, now you've done it with a joystick. Oh boy, Atari was better had a joystick. But if you look at it, the, it was just a directional pad. Magnavox presents Odyssey, the electronic game of the future. People ask me when my first system was, they say Odyssey, what the fuck is that? You know, like, I'm crazy. The Odyssey was like the third place console. There was like Atari and Intellivision were like the two big camps. And then the weird fringe third party was, was the Odyssey too. And what's really amazing about it is if I recall, like 90 some odd percent of the games for the Odyssey 2 were written by one guy named, I think his name was Ed Averitt. And they put his name on here. Let me just, yeah, E. Averitt. So this one guy, this Ed Averitt, like all the other companies had teams of programmers, but you picture Magnavox had this crappy office maybe from a converted toll booth and poor Ed in there just laboring, making things out. They'd like take a snapshot of something that was working in an arcade and like hand him a Polaroid and say, Ed, we need one of these. And yeah, chop chop, Ed. My first video game experience, I think the earliest I remember was my dad brought home an Odyssey 2, which is a real piece of shit. And so I didn't really consider that my first system. My first system was really the Commodore 64. And that's because my neighbor had one. It had amazing music and graphics, 16 colors. And it, what sold me on the Commodore was more of the music than the actual computing power or the graphics. And that's what actually made me a musician today. From the early days in the 1950s, when they started having these computers around universities and big companies and stuff, people would take their spare time to come up with ways to use them for games or music or other things. And that's what Nolan Bushnell saw, was these, um, these games on computers that cost a million dollars and saying, gee, is there some way to bring that into a commercial realm? And then at the same time, you had um, uh, Ralph Baer um, you know, say, gee, hmm, we can, we can uh, put together stuff that hooks up to a person's television set and they can play a game on a TV set. And that was the first Odyssey. And at Mattel, Mattel Electronics, biggest toy company in the world, uh, somebody there, actually by the name of Richard Chang, looked at that and said, we should have that, we should have one of those. How do we get one of those? <laughs> Midway through that development, uh, Atari actually went through a hard time. They stopped selling them. They, people were not buying them as much as they thought they were gonna be buying them. And then what happened was Space Invaders. Now, addicted's not the true correct word, but I loved playing Space Invaders so much that when I travel any place, I'd make sure that there was an arcade nearby that I could stop and play Space Invaders for a while. The legend is that like, it was so popular in Japan that like, they couldn't make enough of the yen because everybody's dropping it in Space Invaders machines. Space Invaders is one of the first games that really blew up. See if you can eliminate the entire armada with this like primitive cannon while these like super advanced aliens descend on you dropping turd bombs. You know, you play Space Invaders, and as you kill more of the aliens, the game speeds up. And this seems like it makes a lot of sense from like a gameplay standpoint. The amazing thing is, that was totally an accident. That was all chance. The crude computer at the time, when it came to drawing a full screen of Space Invaders, it took so much effort for the machine to draw them, that it would slow everything down. So the less it had to draw, the quicker it could draw them. And so by the time you get down to one, it would be able to draw it really fast. They released Space Invaders for the Atari, and that's what everybody wanted. And that's, that's where really the game industry learned that you have to have the game. There were probably only about three or four hundred people developing games in the United States professionally at that time, between Atari and ColecoVision and, and Mattel. Because it was the first generation, there was really no precedent beforehand of, of what to do and how to do it. 
right when the Intellivision started gaining some ground, like basically all video games in general just completely collapsed. The demand was going up. People did want to play more video games. More and more people were getting into it. But the crash itself in 1983 came about simply because it was too much, too much supply. Atari tried to push 15 million additional 2600s into a saturated market. They also had a massive overstock in cartridges, which also meant prices dropping. So the Atari 2600 is simultaneously responsible for the amazing rise and spectacular fall of the gaming console industry, culminating on that piece of shit E.T. That was the end. The crash of 83, a lot of people like to blame it on E.T., which, to be fair, it deserved a lot of credit for that because it was a, a singularly awful game made by an otherwise talented developer who was forced into a ridiculous schedule that even Electronic Arts or Activision would say, whoa, dude, you need to chill out there. Everybody kind of put their consoles away and kind of either they got out of video games or they turned their focus to computers. And so for a brief period, you only had gaming on computers, Commodore 64, Apple II, all that stuff. And eventually in 85, Nintendo took a big risk and brought out the NES. And for whatever reason, it worked and it saved the video game console industry. The Nintendo was the first game console that the graphics actually looked like what you would see close to what you'd see in an arcade. Whoa, nice graphics! I'd like to get my hands on that game! You mean you haven't played it yet? Kind of like towards the 90s when everyone consoles really kind of set in with the NES, Super NES, Genesis, all that. Arcades were kind of like this mundane thing that you had to kind of decide, well, do I want to drop five dollars a quarters into an arcade machine, or do I want to pick up a game or borrow it off from my friend? Because people abandoned ship for the home games, arcades would be full of 15, 20, 30 games that were completely unpaid for. So all at once, the whole system collapsed. The console is so advanced now that why would you want to go somewhere and, and play a regular video game when like the most amazing games around, or you can just play at home. I think that the arcade as a concept will be forever. I think its current articulation is very bad. Uh, they're kind of based around spitting out tickets, which are virtually worthless. Even if you do hit the jackpot, you're still getting a bear this big that you don't even want. Uh, it's, it's pretty sad. When I grew up, you had to leave your house to play a real video game. You know, you had Atari or the Commodore 64, which were great for home play, but if you want to see the latest graphics and the best sound, you had to go to the arcade to experience that. The building was an arcade. It wasn't connected to anything. Like, it was just its own world. All the arcade games playing, like, at the same time creates this, like, pleasant cacophony for gamers. And you, you kind of had this feeling that you were onto something that not everyone was onto. You know, it's like, wow, there's a coolness here that I get, and everyone in here gets. I used to put my quarter up on the game and, you know, wait my turn and either serve someone or get served. Jamming quarters from the bottom trying to get free games, or we did things like drill holes in the quarters and attach strings and put them in a the slot and pull them back out to get free credits. Yeah. Ended up kind of cutting classes here and there to go play Street Fighter 2 down at the arcade. I only needed 50 cents really to play all day four quarters and that would be enough to play like almost all day because you know we we're good right and then meanwhile outside your bike's getting stolen that's the saddest part of it all that's sort of like something you'd brag about I was so good at this my bike got stolen <laughs> sometimes I would be in arcades for uh, four or five hours and then just like finally stand up from my chair to uh, go to the bathroom or something and, and then get back in line to, to be the reigning king of the arcade. Back in the day, like when you could pass a boss or a certain level at an arcade game, kids would just kind of crowd around behind you and be like, oh, look, he's doing it. You could be the champ, and if you were the champ, you were kind of a star. And believe it or not, at the arcades, I mean, if you were that good, girls would hang out with you. I mean, you're not getting nothing, but girls would be hanging out with you watching the game. And they were, in memory, they were hot, but I think it's because they were the only ones.
I used to hang out in the arcade. That was kind of the thing back in the day. Whether I be playing the arcade or beating the kids up in the arcade, you know, for their token money. When I was really young, I wasn't allowed to go to arcades. I had two arcades in my local mall. My mom didn't want me going to them because she thought, oh, you know, it's bad people there, it's drugs. You know, we'd get rip-roaring drunk, smoke a couple joints, drop a hit of acid, you know, have a pocket full of quarters and just wait to throw down with some kid, you know? I'm telling you, man, back in the 90s, it was, I, I don't know if I would have been able to hang with that because I was just a little kid. It wasn't the best crowd in the world, you know, the place got shot up a couple of times. <laughs> I was playing, uh, going on my lunch break every day, playing Mortal Kombat. So I'm playing this kid and he was whooping everyone's ass and I get up and I'm playing and I just, I wiped the floor with him and he got so mad he punched me in the face and he walked away. <laughs> Little Filipino kid. You know what? If you did not have some guy sitting in a wire mesh cage, smoke, chain smoking Marlboros all day and giving, you know, you know, practically mumbling under his breath about what a, you know, what an asshole you were while he was making change for you, you didn't ever experience an arcade. That culture is dead. The arcade model is gonna change to the point where it's not about going and putting your quarter up, it's about you're gonna pay for blocks of time and you're gonna sit at a console and you're gonna play against another guy. Thankfully, you'll still have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. I don't discredit it, I, I, you know, I'm fine with it. It's just, you know, it's where we go to play our games. The arcade community, it's really the people uh, that go there to play the competitive aspect of everything. And we still have that element. That element is not dead. You know, even though we don't run uh, tournaments on arcade machines anymore, we still have arcade tournaments in the sense that we are all meeting up every week. We're all playing competitively. We're all friends. It has now evolved into, you know, this console arcade generation. Sony, Nintendo, like, Microsoft, you know, it's similar to what MP3s and iTunes Store did to, the, you know, like the record store. It just completely wiped it out. And except for one here that we have in Vegas, which is, it's more of like a bar nightclub type thing that they've incorporated the old vintage uh, uh, stand-up arcade games in, and that's downtown, uh, called Insert Coins. They have DJs, booze, and, and games, and what more could you ask for? The video game industry is $87 billion a year. I figure let's uh, open a bar for gamers. We have arcade cabinets, we have video game consoles. One of the things that makes our bar stand out amongst others is that we have our video game play at the bar as well. It's almost invigorating the arcade scene in terms of the social aspect of video gaming, but we're all adults now and we drink, so it seems to be working well. When I was trying to get the money initially from my prospective investors, they're like, I don't get it. Who plays video games? And just shaking my head like everybody. Well, there's a bar downtown called Insert Coins. The only problem is you can't serve two masters. You can't run games and run a bar. Since the games don't really make any money, you end up spending all your time trying to improve the bar, and pretty soon, it's just another bar. From a strictly business model, it will not survive without a bar. There's no question about it. We have not yet advanced our cultural acceptance of video games to a degree, let's say, in Japan, where you know, large groups of people go to a five-story arcade uh, it's it's just, it's not yet here. Uh, would I like to see it that way? Absolutely. I mean, that's the reason why I put all this into Insert Coins is so that one day, you know, there are arcades again. It's just a resurgence, a rebirth, a, uh, a different evolution. Arcade games were actually illegal in the town where I grew up, so I had to like ride my bike all the way across town. Uh, but when I saw Street Fighter, uh, things changed. It went from something that I that I liked and, and had fun doing to something that I had like a need to do. They got Street Fighter 2 at the pizza parlor down the road. 
And that was what everybody was doing. That was the big thing. You know, I became pretty well addicted to the game for several years of my young adult life. It didn't steal my childhood. It, it, it ushered in my manhood. Fighting game genre is the face-to-face. -face. It's the, the boxing of video games. You know, I'm face-to-face -face with you, and if I'm beating you, I'm gonna talk shit to your face right next to you so that my spit flies on your face. Fighting games as a genre were just one of the first ones that r really encouraged multiplayer play and versus play. That element of competition, not just versus a system in the game, uh, but versus another human, that's what made video games really come alive for me. It's real competition. Call it a sport, call it what, whatever you want. It's one person against another person. It's two minds going at it. This community is in people's faces and generally kind of angry, and I love that. I want people to get mad, because I think that I think that garners competition. Even though Street Fighter players are video gamers, they don't fit a lot of their the, the regular video gamer stereotype or paradigm, I should say. Street Fighter community has um, some of the most competitive alpha male people I've seen in any other community. It's it's hard to describe, but they're great people, it, most of them. <laughs> I didn't really understand the the culture and the following behind Street Fighter and their events until I had to film it. Justin Wong and, and Daigo, I thought they were just regular dudes that just liked the video game that I played when I was 10. But um, the third round, they killed each other and they got a double KO at the exact instant. The whole room bounced. Right then and there, I, I realized what this meant to people. Evolution 2012. This is the World Finals Tournament. Now this is for the most money. This is for all the bragging rights. This is, you know, where you prove all your smack talk. You have 2,000 people in there willing to come to Las Vegas from all around the world to compete for $20,000. I think it's a big statement about the game. It's very nerve-wracking because a lot of people are here to prove a point. A lot of people are here to prove that they deserve to be one of the best in the world. You have people who are hungry. You have people who play every fucking week. Every week for a year. And all they're thinking about is winning EVO. Comparing a competitive gamer to a pro athlete, I think in terms of mindset and dedication and skill and ability and drive, uh, they're all on the same plane. Maybe you're not six foot seven. These things will keep you out of many professional sports. Whereas pro gaming, you get all types. And I think that opens the world of competition in a way that we've, we've never seen before. This here is probably the coolest uh, fighting game trophy. This was for the very first Street Fighter II co uh, competition that they ever had. My name's Chris Tang. You could describe me as someone whose life has been profoundly impacted by video games, AKA a nerd. Oh, this is my command center. This is where I extend my influence to the far reaches of the galaxy. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot else um, in my life. I wasn't very popular. I don't think girls liked me yet. So when I got into video games, 
it kind of gave me a little self-esteem boost. boost. 1994, um, Sega decided to have a tournament and the prize was $25,000 in everything that Sega made for a year, including consoles, every game they made. And um, I did very well. Um, actually, I won the whole thing. Uh, whereas my parents did not approve of me playing video games previously, now that I was actually kind of like winning things and getting a certain amount of fame from it, now they were com in complete and total approval. Ooh, now, this Chris Kang guy is not to be trifled with, nor is Philip Dickey. They are right on top of it. The Nintendo World Championship City Finals. Here are your hosts this evening, Terry Vitora and John Fain. Tonight, we go for the very best in the business in three age categories. That's right. We'll be looking for one city champion in the age group of 11 and under, 12 to 17, and then one city champion in the age group of 18 and over. Then when the championships came along, you know, I had always wondered, uh, maybe I was the best in the world. I knew that I was the best kid I had ever met. Uh, the 1990 Nintendo World Championships. Uh, this thing is part of Nintendo lore and legend. And they had these giant stages with awesome professional announcers calling the action. Unbelievable! Now Christian has got himself some uh, invincibility and he is dazzling right through there. Every city would crown a champion and um, they would send them all to Universal Studios to find who was the best in the world. With a score of 1,993,000 points, he will represent you in Oakland, California as your championship. You're looking at Robin Mahara! I just blew everyone away. I was scoring in the two millions and the second highest score in that whole city was probably, well actually it was Chris Tang. A guy named Robin Mahara beat me. Uh, so I had to go to Los Angeles the next week and in Los Angeles, I won there. You are city champion of Los Angeles, it's Chris Tang! Way to go. <laughs> this exhibition is open not only to the people who have invested a tremendous amount of time in gameplay, game theory, and design, but to anyone who's ever been delighted, inspired, or touched by a game that they've played. I'm really excited that video games are in the Smithsonian American Art Museum because this is video games crossing out into other aspects of the world that they never were before, right? This is validation that video games are art. They're art, they're science, they're math, they're engineering. I mean, there's, they're the intersection of all of these things. Video games are the ultimate playground for the mind. And I believe this is incredibly empowering for kids. We had a very specific dialogue that we wanted to have, or narrative, if you will, through this exhibition. The goal was to examine 40 years of video games through the lens of 20 systems comprised of four genres of games. Those of us who grew up playing video games for our entire lives, for those of us who have spent countless hours creating these worlds that we can then share with the rest of the world, we already knew that video games were art. The problem was we were such an early medium that we lacked the vocabulary to describe it as art. Video games are art on many, many, many levels. And also there has to be the incredible elegance of an actual gameplay in there so that it becomes a fun, desirable experience. It transcends just being a form of media to become art when it is played. Video games as an amalgam of all traditional art, from illustration to painting to music to composition and poetry. The result is greater than any individual part contained within the game. Saying that video games are forms of art is like saying that uh, flowers are forms of art. They are not forms of art. They are models. They are like environments. You can extract art from there. A video game is the most brilliant fucking piece of art because not only did someone create it and give it a story and give it life, but they also made it so that you could interact with it. I mean, can you go fucking interact with a painting at a museum? So yeah, anybody that says a video game is not art, up your ass, fuck you. I'm a Cold War kid. Um, I grew up 
in the 70s and the 80s. It was a really fun time to grow up because there was all this insanity going on in the real world. So what did we have? We had Atari, we had we had uh, Intellivision, and then after that we had ColecoVision, and then we had all these other visions, and all these gaming companies were warring for, you know, teens' attention. It just, for me, it became one of those things where if I played video games, I was able to disconnect. Just having that joystick, having that Atari 2600 that I begged my mother for, it just opened up a, a world that was so different. Than, than reality. So that's that's why the controller, I brought it back as an artist and I started hitting it all over the streets because I think the controller now has a completely different meaning to people. The premise of Big Brother, the premise of who controls who, what controls what, you know, and other deep shit like that. We are at Destroy Headquarters, aptly my, um, my rundown, my rundown garage with my arsenal of paint, paste, liquids that normally shouldn't be stored in your home. I wanted to create a dialogue that everybody could could understand and read. Who doesn't love a joystick? Some people looked at it as something really, you know, jovial and fun to look at. Other people looked at it more of a social commentary or a public commentary. Lately, I've been doing a lot of 1% pieces because I think this entire country has gone, well, I don't want to get too political, but it's gone completely crazy with the three corporations have raped the common man. To me, the joystick represents that type of control as well. Control is everywhere, right? My name is Miltos Manetas. Uh, I am an artist, a painter, working a lot with uh, digital media, depicting the psychological landscape of our days, cables, computers, people playing video games. I went out to the store, bought a PlayStation uh, and a copy of Lara Croft, of Tomb Raider. But I didn't care to play. My interest was not playing, but discover immediately something interesting to film. So I started playing the game, dying by the poisoned arrows, filming that for two hours, fill up a tape with this, and I had a beautiful video artwork. So in this way, I got involved with video games. I mean, I discovered that they are like a Pandora box for an artist. I would use the hardware as props and the software as uh, environment to search for myself. A little later, I start, uh, I, I bought a Nintendo 64 and Super Mario. And there, the most interesting thing of the game was that if you would not play with Super Mario, he would lay down and fall asleep. And I thought, this is genius. For me, this is like biggest, big, bigger than Picasso, bigger than anything that any Adi Warhol or anybody ever did with visual culture. The only artists I take seriously today are the artists that play video games in a creative way. I think that this is the art of our days, is the art of playing video games. Since the birth of this planet, a memory has become deeply engraved onto the genes of all living things. Tekken Torture Tournament is a, is a, a hack of a PlayStation 1 a Tekken game. Players were hooked up to uh, these armbands that gave them electric shocks. As you were getting hit in the game, your muscles were contracting and disabling your ability to control the joystick. The defining moment of that game happened when uh, we did the game in Australia and then all the local like, Tekken champions flew in to play this game. We also cranked up the intensity for that tournament all the way to the end, so it was extremely painful, um, almost intolerable. 
these were people who were invested so deeply in this virtual fighting game that uh, w watching them play Tekken Torture with this physical pain and, and fear that came with it, um, it felt like watching people go through a real rite, rite of passage. There, were, there was just the emotion and the intensity in the space was like nothing I'd seen before. My name is Eric Nakamura, and we're at Giant Robot 2, which is an art gallery. Uh, we started Giant Robot in 1994 as a magazine, and then uh, kind of branched out from there, started getting into art, video games, just kind of doing all, anything we can, you know, fun stuff. We've been doing a video game art show for like four or five years now in a row, and it's just, just to kind of get our artists that are doing their own work and just making them think about video games for once. Actually, a lot of artists will say they don't play games at all, but then in reality, I could say Tetris and they'll go, oh yeah, yeah, that, I play that. And I'm like, well, that's a game, you know? And a lot of times they play games on their iPhones or, you know, they don't even consider their regular game playing as game playing. I think games have permeated our lives in so many ways that you don't even consider it as a special thing anymore. It's just something that you do and live with. It began as a, an art show in tribute to that wonderful era of 70s and 80s video games. I was very fixated on the idea of, of games as culture because no one really thought there was a place for a culture in the games industry. Everyone was concerned about star ratings and, and news, but never, never the people. What we do with I Am 8-Bit is allow artists complete freedom to do whatever the fuck they want. Like the magical thing is, that Mario can be interpreted in a billion different ways. It's about exposing it in a way that was kind of intimate to you. Dave Croslin, fantastic artist, and he's making these custom arcade machines for a Super I Made Bit art show. And uh, one will be projected onto the wall and be the you know kind of the world's biggest arcade machine, and the other one will be uh, up for grabs to the highest score on the opening night. They told me to just do whatever I wanted, and I, I love like old cartoons like Robotech, and plus Galaga is like one of my favorite arcade games to rock on. Uh, so I did these huge space battles. Like it was like kind of like a Battlestar Galactica with giant bugs. Uh, John Gibson and I were talking, and he was telling me how much he wanted something kind of special, like this big, engaging event kind of thing that would really get people involved. And I took a regular Atari joystick, and I measured all the dimensions that I could actually measure and I multiplied that by a factor of 15. And functionally inside, it, it was actually built and works a lot like the original Atari stick did. So you can plug it into any, any regular Atari and it'll work. We had it set up outside with the, like a giant projector, so we had like Pitfall, I think, and then we had the joystick kind of set up in the middle. One of the things that was most exciting was uh, Nolan Bushnell, you know, the, the founder of Atari, uh, he was actually there and actually saw and played around a little with the giant Atari joystick. I remember he had this look on his face where he, he was very excited to see this giant joystick, but just behind the excitement there was a slight sense of a little bit of disbelief that anybody would give enough of a damn to go through all the effort to make a colossal version of this joystick that he had worked on designing so, so many years ago. My name is Holly Conrad. I am the commander of Crab Cat Industries and I make monsters, props, and all kinds of nonsense. Almost every costume that I have made has been video game related. Even the first one, I was four years old and I made a, um, a Koopa costume with a green pillow and taped it to my back and ran around the house. And after that, my parents were concerned, but you know, I thought I was awesome, so. <laughs> it was that sort of like, immersive, interactive quality of games that really made me want to, you know, be a part of that whole world. And as I started getting older and playing Baldur's Gate and Everwinter Nights and all those games, those you could actually make your own mods and characters. And after that, I just kind of thought, oh, I'll take it to the next step and start actually making, you know, props from the games. And it just kind of was a natural progression. I wanted to compete, but, you know, video games weren't really doing it for me. Um, 
but I started going to anime conventions, and they would have costume contests. It was a different form of competition. It was creative, and it required different types of skills, like sewing, and being able to design an object in three dimensions. You know, I went from the guy that kept winning the video game tournaments to the guy that kept winning the masquerade competitions. And I have, over the years, gotten over 40 of these awards. Instead of playing video games, I was dressing up as video game characters. And I'll tell you why. Because of girls, okay? You go to an anime masquerade, and I'm like one of the only guys there, and all the other competitors are beautiful girls dressed like Sailor Moon and Cammy. Cosplay is costume play. It is a hobby that uh, men and women do to pay homage to their favorite video game, comic book, uh, movie characters. Uh, my outfit, I'm a cheap kind of person, you know, I'm still in high school. So uh, I was working on a low budget and I was able to throw this together, you know, at a military surplus store. And I feel pretty sick. Mine's a little bit more expensive, say around over 2000 for everything. Jeez. Maybe even more. Sweet Jesus. It's, it's a lifestyle, I, I would say, from what I've observed, more than a hobby. People that are really into it are like hardcore into it. They're just always planning their next costume. They're, you know, always practicing their poses that they're gonna do when they get in costume and like start doing photo shoots. I started playing Street Fighter a long time ago and it's just stuck with me ever since. I've always played Dalsum. I just found his stretching is really, really cool and the fact that he can breathe fire is just too awesome. Video game culture it conjures up an unfortunate stereotype of the sweaty, neckbeard, basement dwelling, you know, hardcore gamer. And stereotypes exist for a reason, so that's, you know, a large component of what's out there. Just for everybody who thinks that everybody, you know, everybody who plays games is stuck up in their room now. There's all genres up in here, man. We got rocker dudes, we got freaking surfer dudes, we got everybody, dude. Everybody plays it's some games, dude. Dudes. We got stoner dudes. <laughs> We're the 420 Dojo crew, in case you don't know. Even my mom plays video games. She can smoke me at Tetris. You know, if I ask her, are you a video gamer? She's like, of course not. But when she's not reading books or watching TV, she's totally sitting at the computer trying to play Tetris or something like that. My favorite game is Minecraft. Uh, I played a lot and uh, I ju just love to build, so build castles, boats, enormous things. It's fun because like you can create anything you want to. If I wanted to create the biggest tower ever, I could just like um, get all these blocks and make it. I love video games because I find that better than TV and believe me, video games are instructive and cool. I probably would have got beat up in high school if I told him I, I played video games a lot. The social stigma, I think, is slowly going away. I think uh, gaming is being, becoming more mainstream. If you go to countries like Korea, it's like accepted. It's like some of those guys in Korea, professional gamers, are rock stars. You know, they're dating the, the pop stars and it's like some weird upside down world over there. I am, I am not ashamed that I play because it's something that I do and I know I do it well. But I just feel like a lot of people don't really understand what it is that we do. I think a lot of people have a huge misconception of gaming. I had a really hard childhood growing up because my mom has MS, so pretty much I've taken care of my mom her, my whole life. She could play games and feel like she was kind of participating in like things she couldn't do. Like if I was gonna hang out with her on say World of Warcraft, she could do it too because she's, obviously she can't walk, but in a game like that, we raided together, we did all that, and there were no limitations. They allow, you know, people of diverse you know, physical abilities to um, to play together in a way that they might otherwise not. So no, uh, I've I've never experienced or even witnessed firsthand video games doing anything but enhancing relationships. Video gaming never really got in the way of a relationship with a girl, but I'll tell you right now, no girl has ever showed me her vagina while I was playing a video game.
Not once. My wife doesn't like um, gaming at all. She never really got it. I think it's just more annoying to her than anything else. My wife is very supportive of the gaming habit. Um, and she games herself. We like to play Gears of War. We play Left 4 Dead. She's actually better at Marvel vs. Capcom 3 than I am. When we were dating, I had arcade games in my bedroom when I was living with my parents. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I didn't see your room until like it was, a few uh, dates later. It was a while. It was about a month or so. Yeah, but I didn't think up. much of it. It wasn't like a big deal. I thought it was cool, actually. Did you? Yeah. Wow, okay. If a guy tells you that, yeah, they play video games and you ask him like, what games, and they say Mario, you're like, oh, Mario? I dated this guy once that like, he said he was a gamer, but he played like games on his iPhone, which like totally don't count, you know? So, I did stop talking to that one. I think it's absolutely a requirement that any guy that I'm dating play video games because otherwise I'm not really sure what we would do in our spare time. <laughs> With my ex-girlfriend, we used to sit there and play games together, but you know what's really funny? When we broke up, I remember her saying, you know what, you can have your video games. <laughs> you know, but you can't have me and like left. I said, okay, well, at least I still have my video games. I do have uh, a friend who lost his girlfriend because he got into Warcraft like really deep and she was like super hot. So, his loss. I mean, if you don't like getting laid, then I guess Warcraft is your thing. Since I love games so much and playing games, I know there's times when I've said like, you know what, I'm not gonna hang out with you this weekend. That's happened often enough, you know? Some games are just more important than women. Oddly enough, in EverQuest, I did know a guy who, um, who his marriage did break up over the game because it's like our guild leader comes on one day and he says, hey, it's a boy, it's a boy. My, my wife just gave birth to a boy. And we're like, how long ago? And he says, two hours ago. And we're like, dude, get over there with your wife. Why are you online with us right now? I pull up in front, I call, I'm here, five minutes. Great, I'm sitting up. Half an hour later, I was super I did pissed. leave her out there. It was because I was laddering and, you know, I didn't want it to affect my rank. Starcraft and... has been. <laughs> I know, that's why it was so bad. Starcraft <laughs> has come between us. I have been the girlfriend who has gotten annoyed that my boyfriend was playing video games too much. And so I would kind of just go hang out and he would play video games and I would just kind of <laughs> snuggle at him and he would. That sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah, I want one of those. Ideal relationship. <laughs> Actually, the person who got me into Halo was someone I was dating. And one of the nerdiest things we've done was connect our Game Boy Advance SPs and play Final Fight 1 in bed. <laughs> Playing Halo multiplayer, it's a totally different world for a girl because you hear a lot of things like, what are you doing at the kitchen? Go make me a sandwich. It taught me how to talk shit to people because, you know, you have to. Give them that little poke, you know, like, know you're better than them, right? There was no such thing as like a gamer girl where, where I grew up. We all played games. You know, people hit the arcades just in like large co-ed groups. Stepping out of that community was the first time that I really discovered that most everywhere else, girl gamers are more rare. It wasn't until I got older and then the internet happened and I was playing a lot of MUDs on the PC and then when you go online, it was predominantly male. And they're really interested when you are female and playing. You know, a lot of girls are like intimidated to start playing and stuff because you know you're gonna lose at first, but it, it just it just takes like a real gamer to uh, work through all that stuff and and figure out the game and learn how to kick ass and stuff like that. Do you feel like you kick ass when you play? Oh, fucking right, I do. The call of the um, how do you feel about like the, the girls only uh, Street Fighter thing they're having tomorrow? I have to answer that, right? <laughs> I think it was a very ridiculous tournament that they only have girls kind of sexist a little bit because we can't really play with the guys. And by any means am I a sexist or anything like that, you know what I mean? If you're a girl and you can play, I'm in there too, so that's awesome. It looks like I see some cute girls who really do know what they're doing. You know, they're not just sitting there and mashing, which is, you know, which is great. I like to see that there are girls who are really trying to play the game and really learn it, you know, not just be playing the game for the attention. She says the way I present myself 
I'm not a true gamer, blah, 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 blah. I'm just an attention whore. But who's the one walking around in a bison skirt? I guess we have beef with each other. I just don't like her. She's been talking shit about me since last year. And then she started talking shit to me in the game. You don't do that. She's the one who started shit talking first. She said garbage, right? Then I was like, oh, this bitch wants to play. I wanted to shake her hand because I thought it was a good match, but she said, fucking bitch. Oh, no, she's talking shit. She doesn't have the right to talk shit. So who's gonna back her up? Ain't no one backing her up. I'll fuck her up any day. I'm just saying. Oh, oh, that dark talk shit. I'll oh, fuck oh, you up right now, oh. bitch. They call me Circus, that's my code name. I'm a gamer, I'm also a player. I'm from the Almighty Shapeshifters crew. We're all into video games, cartoons, comic books. We're all raised on this culture. And I'm one hell of Mac. Can you tell I'm so I just had this idea. I went over to DJ Bams and we were pillaging all the sounds out of the NES. Kid Icarus and Legend of Zelda happened to be two of the cartridges I brought. He was like, yo, hand me that uh hand me that kid Zelda cartridge. And then I just like froze right there and I was like, you know what? That's it. Boom. Kid Zelda, that's my fucking name. I'm speaking for this underground scene that has gone on here. Everything from 12 inches with video game sound effects put put on with DJ scratching this stuff to us stealing samples from video games and rapping over them and put putting it out like illegally. This is just kind of how we do it. From the Wack MCs. The Wack MCs. I think um because of my love for video games growing up, it definitely influenced the type of music I listened to. And it, it was never intentional. I think it's all very subconscious. Uh, I automatically liked electronic music. My brain has been wired to the electronic generation. And that's a lot to do with kind of like this 8-bit gaming resonating in my ear that I just, I like. That's right, you are listening to the Video Game Music Show here on KSBC. You know, even when I was little, I've always liked uh, video game music. Of course, back then, it was never really even close to being accepted as something you listen to on a pastime. However, my buddy and I used to uh, drive down our streets with the music that were recorded on the cassettes. And um, while everyone else was playing Vanilla Ice, and uh, Millie Vanilli, you know, we're blasting songs like Sonic the Hedgehog and Streets of Rage. I like the Robotnik box theme a lot. You know, the first time I heard that when I was a really little kid, I got really scared and made my grandfather play that boss for me because I was like, I'm too scared. You know, when I go back and listen to these soundtracks now, I'm still impressed with uh, the range of sound and kind of emotion that these guys were able to squeeze out of such a limited chipset. These little 30 second, 90 second loops of music stick with me much more than the pop music of the time. And they've achieved immortality um, in a way that I think, you know, their, their, their composers are probably surprised um, to see. My specialty in music uh, at that time was to you know, understand the requirements of the game, uh, arrange music for the game, and then come up with a data format that was so abbreviated that it would actually fit in the game. You know, now a sound effect is, uh, any sound effect in any contemporary game is much larger than all of the gameplay in the classic and television library. Yo. <laughs> it's the Legend of Zelda and it's really rad. Those creatures from Ganon are really bad. Octorite, Tektites, Levers too. But with your help, our hero pulls through. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> your parents.
parents help you hook it up. I need your help, yo. I'm the man who stands in front of you today. The man has come to be known as the monolithic A. The man who made the beat for me to play. The man who simply intends to say. I never stay idle, but I can get by when it comes to representing this dusty style. Yo, yo, you guys are fantastic, yo. As a rule, I listen to mostly video game music. You know, I, I have a boom box set up in my bathroom just so I can like listen to music, and uh, uh, a lot of it's video game music, pretty much all of it, actually. What's really interesting about music based off of video games is regardless of what instruments you use or anything else, if you start out with do 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 everybody knows whether that's done on a double bass, whether it's done on a, a techno turntable, whether it's done on a heavy metal guitar, they all know it's Mario. Even from another part of the world where we can't even speak the same language, it evokes that sort of childhood feeling and the, the sort of exploration and the action and the running and the jumping. A huge fan of video game music itself and also music that sounds like video game music, chip tunes. It's either music that's made with the old video game chips, you know, that they use in these old systems, or music that sounds like it was. But, you know, you have to have been exposed to those sounds and already feel like it's not obscene to be making music that sounds like square waves and things like that. You know, the sounds of the retro consoles, but with the beats and the mixes of, of today's music, um, you know, I, I'm surprised it's not bigger. We're 8 Weapon, and we make modern music using old computers and vintage video game consoles as musical instruments. In the late 90s, I discovered Commodore 64 music itself without the video game attached. So I'd listen to those when I was a teenager, like when I'd get dressed and just let it loop. So then when I discovered... <laughs> I swear that's, that's so that's dorky. Love right there. One of our 8-bit weapons, of course, is the Apple II. I put together some drum sounds. So that's all straight off the Apple II motherboard. It's pretty fat sounds for one-bit drum samples. Oh yeah. This is a Commodore SX-64. A lot of times Seth will play the notes and then I'll manipulate the sound with the paddle. When I first got introduced to the fact that a Game Boy can make music, it was through my bandmate. We were both homeless at the time, and it was awesome that we got to make music on four separate tracks while we didn't even have a studio. I was intrigued by the idea that you could do like a whole performance with a tiny box that costs like five bucks. With LSDJ, you donate two dollars, you get the ROM, and you get a free emulator. And then, like literally, with just the emulator and the ROM, you can create albums, you know. Alright, this is my first time playing a show. I would appreciate it if everyone takes off all your clothes, puts duct tape on your feet, and sticks to the roof. only desktop computer just completely crashes. And I remember, the, oh, I got that Game Boy, you know, and like creative output, you just want to get something out. And all of a sudden I started realizing this thing is like super powerful. Computer blew up, you know, forget that. I got this Game Boy, I just go to the park and like just hang out. And I'm just sitting there on the tree, just like programming stuff, just laughing my head off and taking my earphones out. like. Do you guys know what's going on over here? Like, this is like the craziest thing that I've ever felt like is going on ever. Hi, my name's Ian Golden. I founded DJ Tech Tools, which is what's around us. So the MIDI Fighter, which is this here, came about because of my first creation, 
which was this controller. This was one of the first DJ controllers ever made, but the buttons were really hard and, and kind of sticky. And Street Fighter in the arcades made me think of the classic arcade button. And it just so happened that there was enough room in this controller that I was able to chop out the old buttons and hack in arcade buttons in the bottom. I got this email from a friend in New Zealand who said, hey, I want a controller with just arcade buttons. I want to call it a MIDI fighter after Street Fighter. And so that's what we did. Together, come on, baby, let's go. The thing about Street Fighter that drew me in was you had to know how to move the joystick at just the right time with the same combination as certain controls and it could produce this exceptional result. And I think that actually has probably continued today in, in my DJing where it's all about doing a crazy combination of different moves that will create an amazing musical result. <laughs> Games were a huge factor in my life growing up. My friends and I used to uh, make tape recordings of the soundtracks from our favorite games. Uh, when I started getting into electronic music later in my life, I was always trying to emulate that chip sound. Um, I didn't really realize it at the time until I kind of took a turn down the road of uh, circuit bending. What is circuit bending? It is taking a musical toy usually a kid's toy or musical instrument, and you tamper around the circuit board, find new sounds just by touching it. Sounds that are very similar to some of the vintage arcade games that I grew up playing. The machine behind me is called the Mogador 2600. It's the only one in existence. It's an invention by myself. It is part Commodore 64, part Moog, part Atari 2600, with a touch screen. This is a special Odyssey. It has the U-Type It Talks mechanism built to it, and you type words and it says it back in an 8-bit voice. Data process. High frequency initialized. I, I played keyboards for Farside for six years, and my main axe was a, a micro mo and it would break on stage. It would break on the road, and I had to learn to start fixing it. I'd open it up with a screwdriver and fix whatever was broken, and that's where really uh, circuit bending and electronics began for me. Yeah, this is a circuit bent Commodore 64. Not many of these around. Yeah, and yeah, I did some mods to it. It's it really is a keyboard. You can play it like a keyboard. So you know you got C D E F G A B, and then you got your your sharps and your flats up here, and then you got your whammy bar. You have your octave buttons. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a keyboard. It's pretty gangster. Pretty freaking gangster. Yeah, I'm gonna demonstrate some sounds here, made on some various devices. <laughs> You can control the pitch with this pitch dial, so you can have it high pitch or low pitch, and then uh, the random glitch button. Sometimes it triggers right off the bat, sometimes it doesn't. Each thing bends different. This little toy here is like a little 8-bit wheel toy that makes some little sound effects. And then you hit this button here, you might get a random, you get a random glitch out of it. But sometimes I'll be circuit bending, and then all of a sudden you'll see a smoke thing come up, and that's usually a bad sign. You don't want the smoke thing to come up. Sometimes things break in the middle of a song. No two shows are the same. So, but it's always fun. Yeah, these devices are kind of not always the most stable. You can't really trust any of them to produce sound perfectly at any one time. It's kind of bad because there is kind of a one single point of failure for each one of these things. So if one of them kind of breaks at some point, I can't, I just can't play. I broke it. And I'm not even kidding, I don't know what happened. And I guess that's the end of the set. So. The thing with chip music especially is that the it's like the minute that you pull out sort of any sort of like vintage gaming hardware, an audience that isn't educated expects a certain kind of like, oh, they're going to do like, gonna play Mario, yeah, Super Mario songs. covers or like, you know, like play Mega Man or like just whatever. And like, we, we're not, we're not a video game cover band. We've, we've never covered a video game song. We will never cover a video game song. We are the descendants of Erdrick. We're a video game tribute band. Yeah. yeah. 
people respond really well to Castlevania, Mega Man 3. Chrono Trigger gets some good stuff, and then by that time, some people are enjoying it, but are maybe a little lost, and then we break out the da 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 <laughs> Mario has gotten us out of a few pinches. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to name the quartet at the beginning, but Zelda was the first uh, medley that I made, the first arrangement, and so and I really liked the Zelda games. I was just trying to think of something from the series that would just work well. I'm like, Treasure Chests Quartet, <laughs> uh, I don't know, Tunic Quartet. Uh, so yeah, so I just thought Triforce, oh that sounds cool. Tunic, tunic. I'm so glad I have a Tunic Quartet. <laughs> You know, this music really stands out for me mainly because of the uh, nostalgic factor. Um, you know, when I, when I get to play this stuff, I get to think, you know, back to my childhood when, you know, you just had your siblings, your friends over, and you're just playing through, like, I don't know, Mario 64 or whatever it is. Festival is a annual party it's in New York City over three days where they collect as many different styles of chip music from around the world and present them. It's a pretty beautiful phenomenon to see like that there's so many people in so many different areas that are actually using this technology to make music. The, uh, the Blip Festival, that's sort of the, the, the apex of like every chip musician's like, I don't know, career. Have you ever been asked to play at like the Blip Festival or like any of those? Hell no, I think all those people hate me. Am I going to go? That's up in the air, probably not. <laughs> that could have been cooler. Making a movie or really any other media out of video games is a really daunting proposition because forcing a video game to be something where there is no choice and no deviation and you just passively watch the action happen I think is almost contrary to the very idea of video games. It's a very sensitive topic for a lot of people because there have been adaptations that have been disappointing. I think the gamers have a lower tolerance for crap. Um, whereas like moviegoers, they'll tolerate crap and studios know that and so they just, they put out crap. They're like, here, here's some crap. You know, it's almost like now the video games are way better than the movies. It's like, I go see a movie now, I'm, I'm kind of unimpressed. Some of my family members don't play video games like I do. Like, the new Clash of the Titans, they're like, oh man, that movie was awesome. And I'm like, well, yeah, but God of War was kind of more awesome. Did you play that? And they're just like, nah, because they don't, you know, they go to work and stuff like that, whatever. They want to start making another Mortal Kombat movie. You know, there's been a web series, which is actually very, very well made. They kind of want to base it on that. I hear, and they have an interesting director. You know, he's directed Glee. Glee? Yeah. What are they gonna do, sing in the whole movie or something? You're making this up, there is no way this is true, right? No fucking way. Uh, when I did my original short film for Mortal Kombat, that was kind of like my first step in trying to force people to believe that I can do that type of stuff. I always wanted to make big action movie, but who's gonna give a guy like me whose credits all say fame, glee, Britney Spears in sync, they're gonna be like, yeah, let's give him a cool action movie. You know, it's, it's not gonna happen. I knew that wasn't gonna happen. He likes to rip the heads off his victim's body. I have been a fan of Mortal Kombat for a very long time, and of course, when it came out in the 90s, I saw the movie opening day. Now that I'm older and I have a career in the, in the feature film world, I you know, desperately wanted to create it again.
every couple of years. Someone's going to question it. You know, games, are they bad for people? You know, do they make people do things? Which is just, it's just funny. It so doesn't. The games are now encouraging more and more violent scenarios. I want to say Grand Theft Auto was the first popular game where you could really just run up and down the streets and hurt anyone you wanted to. But I kind of have a suspicion that like every single kid who plays that eventually will do so. I mean, I wasn't going around killing hookers, running them over just because I was playing Grand Theft Auto. I wouldn't even think of doing that. I don't know anybody who would think of doing that. And if they are, they are probably on bath salts or, you know, smoking crack. I think there's a clear line of enjoying fantasy to real life morality. I do remember the first time I was like appalled and that was seeing the fatalities in Mortal Kombat. Are you ready? Kids have always played violent games and I remember even when I wasn't playing video games we were playing you know cops and robbers and shooting guns at each other and things like that but video games definitely raised the bar in terms of making it at, at, at times very graphic, very explicit. You know, and these games aren't that violent, really. I mean, the most popular games, a game like Halo or Call of Duty, there's not a lot of blood. There's no limb removal or anything like that. I sometimes wondered if, you know, playing hours and hours a day of like being completely alert if you were going to be attacked uh, wasn't also wearing off on their personalities. About 95% of kids in seventh and eighth grade that play violent video games, it probably doesn't negatively affect their lives in any way. As a matter of fact, what they say is, it actually helps them because they find it to be fun, they find it to be challenging, they find it to be socially critical in their lives. For some kids who have a little bit of anger, the, the game might actually help them vent. Um, for other kids, the whole catharsis thing just doesn't hold water at all. So it really comes down to which kid, which game, how much are they playing. It's really important for parents, teachers, pediatricians, um, all of us, kids, to know other kids and, and identify kids who are at risk. It definitely has affected um, the way I react to things. And it's not constant, it'll spring up. But there'll be times where uh, I'll be walking down the street and I'll see somebody in my peripheral view and my natural reaction will be to spring over and zero in, you know, with my scope on that person, which is really odd. I mean, the first time it happened, it scared the bejesus out of me, but it doesn't happen a lot. But when it does, it, it makes me realize I'm spending way too much time on these silly things. We live in a very ugly reality. Our cities are, are nasty. Uh, our clothes are not interesting. So if you are a kid, of course you prefer to be there in a beautiful place, in a beautiful Super Mario kind of place, or in a place where you can kill 25 monsters, than go out there in New York in a place full of stressed people trying to do job. I would like to see uh, video gamers get out the house more, do physical activities, go play some basketball. You know, I want to see some kids play tag, freeze tag or something like that. Go ding dong ditch, throw some oranges at some walls or something like that. Anything in your life that you allow to consume it will be detrimental, be it in what you're not learning, in the relationships you're not forming. Um, if you play video games eight hours a day, it's going to have that effect. Uh, if you read comic books eight hours a day, it's going to have that effect. If you exercise eight hours a day, it's going to have that effect. It, it is very much like drug addiction. There's no, there's no way around that. I mean, basically, you know, I think for about a year and a half, I would get up, go play World of Warcraft, and then go to sleep, and that was it. That was the day. 2003, um, I started playing World of Warcraft. My son had just been born, and suddenly I just got so enthralled with the game, and just, that was all I did. My wife was kind of, well, she, she's always been agitated about it, and then she started playing. Suddenly there was two people that were zoned out of the world. Playing became more important than 
taking care of business, paying bills. Um, next thing I knew, I was being served divorce papers. My wife met a guy online playing World of Warcraft. She left me and then two weeks later he was living in her apartment with her and my kids. It's safe to say that video games destroyed my marriage. World of Warcraft, hands down. The Get Well Gamers Foundation uh, is a charity dedicated to taking people's old video games and systems, refurbishing them, and installing them in children's hospitals. You know, we want to be the Red Cross of gamers. We want to, we want to provide this, you know, scientifically backed, proven therapy to virtually anyone who wants it. Well, the origins of the foundation are very personal. Um, I was very sick as a child very often. Uh, I've had pneumonia 12 times, bronchitis 16 times, 27 broken bones, psychomotor epilepsy, blood poisoning, and it got to the point where I had my room at the local children's hospital. The little break room down the hall from my usual room uh, had had a couple arcade cabinets installed in it. I would drape my little IV drip over the second player controller and, you know, press go because the hospital had mercilessly put them on free play. And you become so involved in the, the processes of the game that uh, the minor and sometimes major aches and pains of being sick just sort of fade into the background. You know, you don't, you don't have time to hurt. You've got a princess to save. I had uh, mother and father in uh, senior living communities in 2004, and I played Wii in 2008, Wii Bowling. And I just had this idea that this would be a good opportunity to start lead play on a national basis. Physical activity with gameplay has always been a real important thing and anytime you can get a person in a rest home to be standing up and throwing a virtual bowling ball or trying to chip onto the fifth hole, um, that's good. When you can match the physical activity with a mental activity, that's like the, the perfect storm of neurogenesis. I uh, partnered up with Elizabeth Amini. We started building out this website called Anti-Aging Games. We make uh, a convergence of games that are good for you. you know, they grow your brain, they make you smarter, they teach you something. We were testing our games on people with strokes, and there was a guy there who couldn't talk, couldn't, couldn't move his hands, couldn't type. Um, the only thing that he could do is he could lift one arm and drop it. And it was really remarkable to watch him play our games. He played our Code Cracker game, which is the numbers game. The first number, I'll never forget this, it was 22. And so he tried to drop his hand on the keyboard, and what happened was it, it entered 222. So it took him a couple tries, but he figured out exactly how high he would have to drop off, drop his hand in order to hit the keyboard without bouncing. And then he proceeded to just kick the game's butt. Like he got better scores than I do on that game. And his entire, like his therapist was there, everybody was around him, and they were like, oh my God, this guy is totally intact on, on the inside. I really believe they have the capacity to do more than just entertain and, and you know, be, be good for fitness and good for learning and, and, and a real kind of excellent framework for uh, uh, moving the world forward. I believe that game technology is going to allow us to teach kids in high school 100% of what they need to know, what they're currently learning, in about six months instead of four years. And so I believe that the mesh of the games and the addictive nature of games that can happen sometimes. I want the kids of the future to be addicted to learning. Ultimately, we can make a bunch of crap games just for money, or we can make games that really help people in terms of memory improvement, in terms of speed processing, in terms of everyday life. 
Um, whether it's healthy people or people with strokes, traumatic brain injuries, um, the, the power of video games is so, so strong. Check, check, check. Here we go. Video games are, they're, they're fun, they're positive, that's what they're meant for. You know, all parents see are the violence, that's all they see is the Call of Duties. I think parents, if they stop to look at a game like Madden and to see how much information their kids were processing, I think they'd be amazed keeping track of all the teams, the league, the players, the stats, all that. I mean, they're essentially coaching a virtual football team, kids that are nine years old are doing this. And it's impressive to me personally. I'm a father myself. You know, I have a son, uh, six years old, he's autistic. So as he got older, it kind of got a little worse, you know, because it wasn't anything to reach him out. Whether it was Street, Sesame Street, whether it was anything, there wasn't anything in his world that could reach him out aside from video games. And that was the only way he learned how to take risk, how to, you know, be brave enough to be like, oh, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this jump in Mario. I'm gonna do this. I had some really terrible experiences at college with some of my dorm mates, um, like threats. Uh, I almost got beat up multiple times. I had people post signs all around the dorm making fun of me for being gay. And at this point, I didn't even know I was gay. I started playing Final Fantasy VI for the Super Nintendo, and I just started playing it over and over and over. And it was like the most crazy, life-changing experience of my life. I mean, there's stories in this game about suicide, pregnancies, like there's 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 stories about like murder and lost love and betrayal and like people like not being comfortable with who they are. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like I'm totally like losing myself in this game and really kind of like finding myself. And like from now on, I've just been a different person. I'm more open-minded, you know, like I'm completely comfortable with who I am, you know. I came out to my parents, like everything in the rest of my life after that moment, I like to think was because of that game. I think there's more flavors to life than just a, a adrenaline and aggression, and that drives a lot of games, but not all. And we're starting to see, I think, especially in the last few years with the explosion of indie development, uh, a lot more personal vision and people who are setting out to make something uh, through a medium that I think most people associate with uh, just guns and sort of childishness. The palette available to a game developer right now has never been as rich. A kid can sit down and build a 3D game in a weekend and publish it to all platforms. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. We're now getting the tools into the hands of creators in every corner of the planet. And I believe that we're really on the precipice of this renaissance that will occur in game development. Any kid with a little bit of passion can build a game. It wasn't too many years ago that that same passion was not enough. 30, 40 years ago, it would have been millions of dollars to build that same game, and now you can do it on a home computer or on an iPad, so if you've got an idea, I think you should run with it. From the very beginning, from the, from the, the Magnavox Odyssey brown box, all the way through to the Wii U, like, that's still just been like one lifetime really of video games. It's such an important part of history and being able to see how video games have evolved from the 80s to the 90s into today, it's been incredible. We used to have like, you know, an arcade to go to and that was, you know, filled with pinball machines and arcade machines and then we had the home consoles and that was cartridges and, and discs. And I think in the future, it's just going to be all digital. It's going to be out, just out there for you to grab. Games are seeping into people's lives in ways that don't require, you know, a commitment to a giant box and sitting in front of a TV. It's just going to become part of the fabric of everyday life. And it's hard to imagine that ever changing. It, it kind of infects every type of entertainment, whether it be feature films or TV shows or music, you know? And for a very universal audience now, it's not a very specific culture anymore, I don't think. You know, they become shared culture more and less subculture, and that's really the shift. If you make a, an 8-bit graphic of a space invader or Pac-Man, everyone knows what that means. I do think it's a big deal. Actually acknowledging that video games have a, have a place as like a genuine cultural event. These are the things in our world now. And they were definitely worth commenting on. Right? Yeah! Hell yeah!
Games are interactive in a way that um, movies and stage plays and novels can't be. And if we're actually making choices in the role of people that we've never been or couldn't be, I think our lives can be more fulfilling. Because it involves the individual and it reflects back, it allows you to reach deeper into the human psyche. Video games offer a holistic view into life. When Mario sleeps, I sleep, and the viewer sleeps, because we are all Mario. What people do is play, and to me, sort of what being a human is all about. And I think that's sort of what's driving the rise of games and will continue to drive the rise of games. We are at one of the changing points in history, and I think that the games have had an effect in that. Yeah, video games and ATM machines, I think, <laughs> have changed the world.